So I'm going to give you a case study now on um, a particular bit of work we did in 2008. We finished it in 2010 at the Newmont, which was the funeral of a particular individual from the First World War. Um, I want to pay real tribute to Steve Litherland, who was the archaeologist, the forensic archaeologist, and member of the CIFA forensics group, who led the archaeological work and who really sadly died last year. So bless you, Steve, um, and thinking of you when I give this talk. You'll be familiar with the sheer numbers of those whom there are no known grave on the Western Front in the First World War. Uh, sometimes you go past these cemeteries and you'll see an unknown soldier's grave. Uh, you should go and see the huge monuments, I think in particular of the Dieppe on the monument, uh, memorial on the Somme. And then also this one, Eddie, this is the main gate on which there were 54,000 names of those with no known grave. When it was inaugurated, it was put together by General Plumer, who said to all those families that were attending, your loved one is not missing, they are here. And this is a very poignant image at the Australian War Memorial of most of Australian soldiers gathered outside the main gate and lost their number. And this is why it leads us to the discovery of a uh, soldier's remains in 2008 by the group No Man's Land Archaeology a mixture of professional archaeologists, volunteers, forensic specialists, uh, military personnel. And uh, this was found in the attack positions from the Butlam scene to the place on the 10th of June 1917, and it started at 3.10 in the morning. The Australian Defence Force wanted me to show you the uh, line drawing rather than photographs of the body. So this is what and then we'll go through the various bits that we've had on the body and uh, what information it could lead us to. So starting with the, the lower end, you've got the... The boots, these allied boots, still uh, laced up, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's an allied soldier because if you find good boots, you, you will reuse them in the First World War. In the middle of the body, 150 rounds of ammunition. These are in charges of five. These are British 303 rounds, all in little pockets. Um, it's classic what you'd expect an attacking infantryman to have in, in, a, in a battle of 1917, British pattern, as I said. Iodine amples and medical kit. Two uh, amples still had the iodine in them. One was, was broken, and you would use these for yourself. You're not meant to use these on your, your colleagues and comrades. These were on the inside. Brody helmet, dated from 1916 onwards, so that's a good starting point. These are not issued before 1916, so what been there from that point onwards. Uh, British pattern, worn on the on the, actually on the back side of this soldier. He didn't wear it into, into battle, which is curious. He wore some others on the head, and had this strap to his back. An entrenching tool, again, you'd want that to turn the line around when you went to the uh, capture positions. And this is actually quite surprising, but it's a huge success. They do capture the German trenches and turn them around. And corduroy, meaning either an officer or cavalry, or perhaps an Australian. That is trousers and sort of material used by these uh, individuals uh, in the Australian regiments. You had a wallet with coins, which, of course, can be the potential for dates on them. And at this end, we found a water bottle. It's a British pattern again, bright blue. It's covered in uh, archaeal material, so it doesn't uh, blue shirts on the signature. And a bayonet. Rifle, you see all the wood is decayed from that. But you will see in the middle of the rifle, there are two bullets in a piece of leather. And that's the rifle sling. And they've worked out that if you put two bullets into the sling, even if it gets wet, it doesn't slip and end up with your rifle around about your ankles. Um, so this is a soldier with a degree of field craft. He's worked out things. So he's not wet behind the ears. He knows a little bit about the experience of life as a soldier. And, you know, these are the Australian 3rd Division, we thought, that fought there, did their first bits of training on Salt Creek Plain in 1916, and then out for their first engagement at the scenes. So maybe someone with a bit of experience of military life beforehand. Up play to the rifle made of brass. Uh, you also get a little disc of on the butt of the rifle, but those frequently denote which unit the rifle had been issued to. If it too too much for us to see anything, there, so no clues. Right in the centre of the body, the only element we recovered which wasn't given to the finds room was this. It's a live Mills bomb. It's a hand grenade. So the, the ordnance disposal experts took it away, and it would have been um, destroyed later on. So it's the only piece of the assemblies that wasn't curated. He had a small box respirator, that's a gas mask that comes in in 1916 or later on, again, good dating. But he also had a fear of gas. So he's got this thing known as colloquially as the goggly-eyed monster with the tit. 
It's a, uh, a pH hood, a gas hood that comes in in 1915. So it's his backup plan. Um, he must have been quite scared of gas because in addition to these two gas masks, he also had gas goggles. He had a toothbrush and the military tend not to share their toothbrush and sometimes they inscribe their names on them. Unless he was called Mr. Flexident France, it wasn't him. His mess kit, there's his spoon. And the first real proof positive of him being an Australian, this is an epaulette button with a map of Australia on, and the leached metals on it have conserved the khaki tunic in this, this area. And this is where we tended to get the surviving as a uniform association with, with metalwork. If you needed any more proof, he had two Australian shoulder titles, one worn on the uniform, one again, Shane Philcroft, two split pins in the same eyelet, one in the back pocket, and they say Australia, if you can read them. And then two collar dogs, Australian Commonwealth Military Forces. Again, those are worn in the uniform. It shows the rising soldier of the Australian Military Forces. So definitely an Australian, definitely built up in 1916. And within the collar, Rob uh, Rob Janoway and his team in the conservation project found little snippets of hair. Um, possibly he's had his hair shaved or cut just going over the top um, to give him a military haircut. Um, those little snippets were also curated in the file. Um, giving us possible forensic data later on. He had lice and also had fly pupae. So uh, again, sorts of things you'd indicate, um, you know, maybe what been through. He'd been hit by shell fire, eviscerated and lost his left arm and we done through the archaeology. And he hadn't had a formal drill because he's got all his kit with him. And he wouldn't have been ploughed away had we not found him when we did in 2008 because already his uh, cranium and his mandible had been uh, tipped over by the some distance. In his backpack, in addition to all the poppers and elements you'd expect to find in, in we found this. It's a German Pickelhaub, it's a spiked helmet, it's an NCO's helmet from the Hessian Regiment. The Australian 3rd Division never faced the Hessians, so why has he got it? And why has he taken it into battle with him? Well, the reason being, it's the souvenir that they all want. Here's a picture of Australians at Bossier on the Somme in, in 1916, and they are all wearing big uh, hubs or feldbutzes, all captured. captured. Um, it's the, the real excellent souvenir. And he knows if he leaves it in his backpack in the, the behind the lines to meet him after the battle, it's not going to be there because it would be built for my friends. So we start off with looking at the maps of where he was uh, discovered. He was found in the positions of the 33rd uh, Infantry Battalion of the 3rd Australian Division, 2nd Anzac Corps, southern flank of the Messines attack. So even with the fog of war, it's very unlikely um, to have been any other unit because it was only about 50 metres from the stopping off point to the Sherman position. So almost certainly um, that's who he would have been a member of. These are the German positions just slightly further up the line in the scenes so that he would have faced with the German trenches. All of our information, um, just from the equipment, says he is post-1916, his death from the helmet, from the uh, gas masks, definitely an Australian from his equipment, possibly not in the first wave because he's got um, the wire cutters. He's got 150 rounds of ammunition. He's an infantryman, not a, a Royal Engineer or anything like that. And he was there in the summer because all of his kit is is summer issue. There's no winter stuff there. And he's certainly not an officer. Um, a little scrap of metal we thought might be an ID tag. I know Sarah um, in this panel will really be much more experienced in this, but it was very, very grave. Even the doctor actually, we couldn't get anything from it. So that was no use. We did know he had dark hair from Rob's uh, retention of the hair. We profiled him from the archaeology we thought he had a fear of gas with all these gas goggles and very proud of being an Anzac because he was wearing his Australian hat not his helmet in the back and with some new souvenirs but let's face it he wasn't his, on his own in the first world war in doing that the Australian records are phenomenal they're all online um, they're all accessible the army was relatively small the Australian army certainly compared to the British and their records weren't bombed in the first world war unlike all of the uh, sorry in the second records so as a result we've got details on all they're missing um we've got the red cross records which gives uh, information from their friends about where they were hit and what happened to them you've even got dental records as an example on the right there plus the ages heights previous wounds what their religion was which might work with the artifacts found and details of the next of kin so a real um boon for anyone researching this sort of subject 
And the Australian Defence Force the military were working with us on the identification process, put together a table of whom they thought might be based on the missing of the area. Uh, very difficult to see this, but you'll see some in, in red. Um, a lot of the Australian army, about a third of them were British, actually. So um, we've got one, two, three, four British there and a Swede as well, which is useful from the next process because we got a state by isotopic assessment of the remains to see where he came from. And this is University of Kent, this work, and the geological signatures are pretty precise. So we were able to say he came from Hunter Valley or Sydney Basin region of New South Wales, which ruled out the chap from Chelmsford, the chap from Sheffield, Scott, the Swede, and uh, made, made it much easier as a starting point to look at the ones from this particular location, which gave us this league day of the likely individuals it might be. And we started off with a chap called James Millington. There's his attestation, when he joins up the Australian military. And here's a picture of James at the start of the war. Uh, wonderfully, we also found the records from a diary that James had kept. Um, in this, he is repeatedly talking about his fear of gas. That's with our profiling. He also wrote a poem, the Anzac ABC, uh, which talks about his pride of having a slap chat and being an Australian, again, work with our profiling. And not everyone is Wilfred Owen. It has to be said in poetry. So his, his poetry said, Nature's helmets for shrapnel or gas, Anzac hat is a thing of some gas. A bit more, you know. Then you know, it's um, clearly being an Australian. Um, he also talks about having a pickle now. K is for Kaiser, culture, comrade. We've all got spiked helmets since last Friday's raid. You can imagine we were very excited that this uh, worked really well with who we thought it might be. But sadly, the osteology told us he was 21 and 5 foot 7. So good lesson, do your osteology before you get carried away with any diaries. So we went out with two um, forensic osteologists to Ypres and the war graves, and they looked at the bodies and were able to say that, well, he had dreadful teeth to start with. Here's an, uh, an image of the molar, which has got um, a pretty rudimentary filling in. Uh, they had um, pretty strong muscle attachments and Schmall's nodes indicating um, quite a, a vigorous lifestyle. There's a vertebra. And he was 175 plus or minus four in height, probably killed by a shield blast, we thought. Over 30. Not we knew that from the fusion of the bones and things like the hyoid bone being fused. So we went back and looked at all the other killed in action records. And we started off with Edmund Heath, not the former prime minister. Here's a picture of his sister, and we've got a mitochondrial uh, DNA check through her line and her daughters. Here's Edward in the bush in uh, the early war years. The DNA through that line was a negative. We looked at Reginald Cowley next. Um, wrong battalion, but everything else fitted really well. Uh, he's on the list of missing at Messines. Uh, there's some pictures. He's in the in the image that he's the one in the top image. He's the one on the far left, and in the bottom image, he's the far right. This watch, this military kit. Again, though, with the negative DNA test. So it led to the one that met most of these elements in the Venn diagram, likely being uh, John Ernest Chapman, a miner from Torrington. But we were never going to get a DNA match for him because he's an adopted child. We have no with uh, and the war graves have a very strict criteria on which they will give a, a named grave and this would never have matched them. So we've been all the way around Australia, all around New South Wales, um, New England, which is where the uh, indicators were from the isotopes with no luck. Um, we tried Alan May, there was an afterthought. Um, the Red Cross record said he'd been buried or blown to pieces and none of none of those things fitted with our situation anyway. Um, he fitted some of the characters. He was nine, uh, 37 when he died, five foot eight in height. That worked well. Um, we did have his dental records, and the one filling we found was 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 present again. There's a filling on his records from Inverell in New South Wales, New England. So that worked with the isotopes, and he was a grazier, son of the mayor. But as I said, the Red Cross records stated he'd been buried or blown to pieces, which is not what on. Here's a picture of. And incredibly, two weeks before the reburial funeral had been scheduled, we got a positive DNA match from his niece, who was 102 at the time. And she said she could remember her mother getting the food saying that 
has been killed in action, and it's an astonishing thing at the UK. Is Alan's house in Roslyn, in New South Wales? And there he is with his family. That's his dad, the mayor at the front, and he's with his sisters. And there he is on the far left, having a picnic. Um, there's his headstone being carved, and the funeral took place at Browns Point Cemetery in Belgium, where he is today. And we all pay our little pilgrimages to go out and visit Alan um, regularly. He had a Federation Guard fire party, he fired three rounds blank over the coffin, and 300 members at his funeral. Here he is commemorated on the Australian War Memorial at Canberra for those killed in action, and there are all his artefacts in display in Singleton in New South Wales of what an Australian soldier in battle, not what they were told to, what the empirically did, and all the conservation work had been done by his team. It's a fabulous collection. For us, really importantly, we have family over for his funeral. There were seven members of his family. And there they are standing at the men in gate underneath the man's name on the memorial. Starting on these 50,000 names, his name is the one directly above James Millington, and the one who fought him for the best part of the year. Uh, that panel is being restored soon. Alan's name will disappear because he now has a name to walk with. And it's all been possible through the work of forensic archaeology and all the associated sciences afterwards. Okay, thank you very much.